All right, uh, welcome back. I guess uh, everybody in this room knows about uh, LIGO and uh, the discovery of gravitational waves. So it's uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, Michele Vallisneri and his uh, first lecture about uh, gravitational waves. Means we begin. So, uh, thank you so much for your introduction and for inviting me here. I'm very, very happy to be at this school. Uh, I think there's a wonderful atmosphere, a wonderful vibe, and, and so I, I think uh, I'm going to have fun over the next few days, and, uh, and I hope you're, uh, you can learn a little bit also. I must say that uh, um, I, I pitched these lessons more or less at the level at which I know cosmology. So I, I know cosmology very little, and I'm going, I have assumed that most of you are cosmologists, so will be cosmologists, and so you don't know very much about uh, gravitational waves. And you do need something, you do know something about general relativity. Um, so the, this first lecture is going to be not blackboard, we'll keep that for later. Uh, it's going to be mostly you know, slides and a little bit at a more qualitative uh, level. Um, so I, my affiliation with, with NASA, with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, uh, in Pasadena, but over my career I've worked on uh, pretty much every uh, experiment to uh, detect gravitational waves from the Earth, from space, using radio telescopes. Not uh, cosmological observations, but I know you heard about that uh, uh, last week, okay, about BICEP. So I'll start with what uh, gravitational waves in a nutshell, let's say. So this could be an elevator pitch. And uh, if uh, when you're going home, uh, you need to tell somebody on your airplane about uh, this discovery, they, they ask you about, uh, you know, how it is that uh, Einstein's was proved right in, uh, in February, you can tell them this kind of things. And uh, you, you may not have the images, but you can, you know, wave your hands or, or draw something. So what are gravitational waves? Gravitational waves are ripples in space time. Um, so this, uh, this kind of image, in addition to being somewhat hypnotic, Right? If, you, uh, if you look at it, you feel uh, inspired, uh, gets most of the facts right. Okay? So there are waves, there are propagating perturbations in space-time. That's, I think that's what the, uh, the lattice there, all the lines, uh, is supposed to tell you, that, that space-time, there's a, there's a metric, uh, there's a geometry, and that's what's changing. Okay? And they're emitted by the accelerated motion of test masses, or of massive bodies, sorry. And the way to get massive bodies in the universe pretty much is to take a binary uh, of any kind, of black holes, of stars. That's your um, uh, a prototypical source of gravitational waves. So this is the platitude, okay? This is the commonplace that everybody's saying, new window, new window. And uh, we've been saying this for 20 years. I got very tired of it, actually, at some point, because uh, when you open windows, sometimes uh, you don't see much. Sometimes you just get noise. And that's what we were doing for, uh, for almost 30 years. We were opening the window and just hearing instrument noise, detector noise of many kinds. Uh, but now, you know, I can put it back again, uh, because uh, it, it is true. Uh, in addition to being a proof of principle and uh, a very interesting test of general relativity, uh, gravitational wave is also a new kind of astronomy, okay? so a new way to, to learn things about the universe. Uh, this is Escher, of course, this image. This was also on the cover of uh, a book by Italo Calvino, uh, Cosmic Comic and Cosmic Comics, where uh, if you read the book, it's apparent that he read quite a bit of general relativity, or he, he knew what science was about. And, and that book is about you know, strange worlds, and, and it's, it's, it's a good parallel to, to learning about general relativity, uh, which is about, in many ways, how strange our world and our time and space are. Uh, so, we don't what, okay? On some, some of the most energetic events and systems in the universe, uh, some of the conditions that uh, um, affect, you know, gravity being weak compared to uh, other interactions, uh, you, you really need to do a lot of work and you need to, to get some very special conditions in, in order to get gravitational waves strong enough that we can see them. Now, um, this is the, uh, the comparison slide with the electromagnetic. The idea is that uh, many people, maybe not those that you'll meet on your plane, but ma many people would be more uh, aware of uh, electromagnetic radiation and radio waves and, and, and whatnot. So uh, the comparison is that uh, whereas light from an astrophysical system would be emitted mostly by the surface or by the um, but the environment, the, the nearby environment of a system, uh, gravitational waves are emitted by bulk, 
motion of masses. Okay, so, so it's kind of like the collective uh, uh, gross scale excitation of the system that you'll see. The typical strengths are very small on the order of uh, a part in 10 to the 21. Um, this doesn't mean that these are not energetic. It's not an energetic phenomenon. If you take that 10 to the minus 21 and you look at it in just in terms of uh, energy that's contained in such radiation, uh, you get something like, uh, I don't know, one watt per square meter, some, something definitely, you know, that would be really measurable by eye even very well if, if it was photons. But it's not photons, it's gravitons. The space-time is incredibly stiff, so it really takes lots of energy to get a, a measurable effect in um, creating ripples in changing distances. Uh, because of the re this reason, space-time is very stiff. However, gravitational waves also you know, pass through unimpeded through pretty much anything. You cannot screen them. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you can lens them because they are, after all, you know, a light-like particle, uh, like, like photons, but you cannot screen them. You, it's very hard to absorb them. They are phase coherent. So again, you don't see just the sum of many photons doing their thing and, uh, on the surface of a star. Uh, you see the phase coherent motion of a binary. So very interesting because it maps directly into the equation of motions, the equations of motion of the system. Um, detectors tend to be almost omnidirectional. They have some kind of pattern of uh, sensitivity, but it's, it's usually very broad, uh, which means that you don't make images, right, with gravitational waves. You're basically detecting uh, one or two time series, and that's the analogy with sound. That's why the other platitude, in addition to the windows, is that you're hearing the symphony of the universe. Um, and you add that, maybe you have two detectors, so you say it's stereo. And, uh, uh, and you add that uh, maybe, uh, let's go here, you throw it on, uh, okay. Okay, you probably heard that already on some website early in February if you went to the news, but that's, uh, that's pretty much taking the instrument data in the one second around the uh, event that was detected and turn it in, into sound. Okay, the, most of the woo, woo woo that you hear is actually detector noise. Uh, you've done something to it, you've equalized a bit the bands. Otherwise, you'd just be hearing the, the lowest frequencies where, uh, where the noise is higher. The signal itself is just a little whoop at the end, okay, that you heard. And uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this video, you hear it twice. The second time is pushed up in frequency. Since, after all, we're turning gravitational waves into sound, we may as well change the frequencies a bit and to, to, to hear it better. It's all, you know, in good... Uh... Okay, click. So, you know, it... it, it doesn't sound too impressive, actually. There's a, there's a radio show on, uh, on American radio called A Prayer Home Companion that's about uh, the, the you know, uh, Midwest and good old values and so on. And one of the things they were saying, ah, oh, this great, incredible discovery, Einstein confirmed and so on. And it sounds like whoop. And, and that's, that's a little uh, underwhelming. But um, however, uh, this slide is... Uh, is a beginning of something, right? It's, it's also the end of something, which is 20 years in which, in giving these lectures, uh, it was all about the prospects and the promise and how people were trying to do things. So finally, it can be how something was seen and all about all, all the other, all the physics that we can draw out of, uh, you know, those, wavelength, those waveforms and those plots, um, and about many more like this that are going to come soon. Okay, um, rest of these lectures, today is uh, to go through quickly sources or some of the source highlights for me at least in gravitational waves and also to tell you about the three leading detection experiments that uh, are operating uh, today. One of which, LIGO, has reached this milestone of actually seeing something. Um, please let's be uh, Socratic, okay? Let's uh, uh, do, do ask questions and comments, and, uh, uh, and I, I think those would be actually the most interesting part of, uh, of these lectures. I, I, think, um, I think the questions that you may have and that I couldn't imagine in advance, uh, we should really try to, to get to those. And uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll try to find it out, you know, tonight I'll go and, and look up either my colleagues or papers and so on, and I'll tell you 
over this week and so on. And also, please come find me during coffee breaks or lunch or, or whatnot if you have something that you think is more, that is better discussed privately. I don't know. It's about your research or, or, or something that you want to know. So sources. There's a spectrum of gravitational waves, just like there is a spectrum of, uh, uh, of photons and there's a, uh, a spectrum of light. And you get uh, different sources and in different bands, uh, and you get different experiments to detect them. Very roughly, uh, since uh, geometrical units are uh, the best way to do general relativity, uh, the frequency, the typical frequency of emission of a source scales roughly as the uh, inverse mass. Okay, so at the highest frequencies, sound-like frequencies of uh, tens to hundreds to thousands of hertz, where the ground-based experiments like LIGO and Virgo are looking, uh, you have systems that are of stellar mass about uh, the mass of our sun, like uh, neutron stars, or maybe several masses, several, up to several tenths of uh, our, our stars, like the black holes that were observed in, uh, back in September. Um, if you go lower, uh, if you go from 10 hertz down to 10 to the minus 3 hertz, so things that are changing with periods of one hour, uh, you get to see heavier uh, systems, typically uh, supermassive black holes, massive and supermassive black holes, a million, 10 million, maybe 100 million solar masses, the black holes that we expect at the center of galaxies. Um, so a lot of the sources you see are, uh, are binaries, which is the um, easiest way in the universe to get some uh, uh, time-dependent quadruple. We'll, we'll talk tomorrow about the uh, generation of gravitational waves and all that. But certainly, you know, you expect gravitational waves from early universe fluctuations, from uh, uh, exotic even phenomena in the u early universe. Uh, you can look for waves in anything that goes uh, boom or bang, in supernovae, in uh, uh, neutron stars that are rotating rapidly and are somewhat non-homogeneous. Um, and... And really, you, you, you want to look at every window in this uh, spectrum. So you, you want to, to push all experiments, and you want eventually to detect gravitational waves in all of them. Um, so black holes, uh, I think you, you know about black holes. But uh, when people think about, uh, when people say that uh, discovery of gravitational waves confirmed Einstein's theory, they're saying the truth, but uh, uh, what they're saying is, uh, is also somewhat limited. In 1916, Einstein had some equations. They predicted black holes, they predicted gravitational waves, but he didn't really believe in either. Okay, so he went back and forth on gravitational waves, whether they were actually uh, physical uh, events or just the mathematical curiosities. He certainly couldn't imagine that black holes existed back then, so it took 100 years uh, not just to understand the theoretical implications of Einstein's uh, uh, relativity. Well, let's say 50 years. After 50 years, we had, we had a pretty good idea of that, but also uh, to realize that uh, these objects, these predictions actually existed in the universe. So a black hole is something very impressive. Uh, it's, uh, it's perhaps one of the things that, uh, you know, when I first studied general relativity, led me to say, I, I, want to, I want to work on these things. I want to find these things because it's, it's kind of like, you know, an elementary particle in space almost. It's a, it's a perfect mathematical solution. It's a, a described only by two numbers, right? Mass and spin, there's no hair. That's all it is, and it, it's pure gravity. That there's even no mass in there, no, no matter in there, and yet it's something that we've seen in, uh, you know, low mass X-ray bi X binaries, for instance, which are binaries where um, you, you have a star uh, or, or a stellar remnant, uh, you know, uh, giving donating mass so uh, into a black hole that accretes it, gets it very hot. You get X-rays from it, a very high luminosity. You get it with time scales, and uh, that, uh, and we get it uh, with inferred masses for this uh, uh, object that can pretty much only be explained by a black hole. Okay, so Cygnus X1, right, was the first uh, system that was uh, really considered a black hole. We also see the big black holes at the center of galaxies. We infer the presence of big black holes from the orbits of, uh, uh, well, from from the typical. There are many ways to see black holes at the center of galaxies, but perhaps the most striking is in our own galaxy. Uh, this detection there on the, on, on the right, these measurements of uh, stars in very tight orbits around an object at the center uh, with an inferred mass of, you know, um, million, four, four, ten to the seven uh, solar masses, and which you can just read off of just the Keplerian motion of this, uh, these stars. And that object is very, very dense, and again, uh, it, it begins... It's, it's very hard for it to be anything else than a black hole, right? It's, it's hard to, to make a cluster of stars that, with this mass that's stable. It's hard to, uh, 
you can make some exotic things, uh, boson stars, for instance, but even those are probably too large to be that object. So black holes are in the universe. Black holes are massive. Black holes can move very fast in a binary because they're so compact, okay? And so they can reach uh, velocities of uh, maybe a third or half of the speed of light. Um, perfect. They're the perfect gravitational wave source, a binary or two black holes. And that's what was the first thing that was seen. So maybe you've seen this movie already. Uh, this is a, I can play it again. This is based on an actual simulation of uh, the solution, a binary black hole solution of Einstein equations that was run on supercomputers taking you know, months or years of CPU time. And it's the last uh, maybe 15 cycle of an in spiral and the virtual merger of those two black holes. So this is all pure gravity, right? That's evolving here, nothing else. Uh, what you're seeing is actually the lensing of the um, the lensing of the, the light from the background stars behind it. Uh, so this uh, again got the, uh, this movie got me a little curious because uh, uh, it was played in, in, the, in the media a lot. It's very pretty. So it will uh, inform what the public thinks black holes are. And to some extent, it's correct, right? It's, it's two holes, it's two black things that uh, deform space around them. But then if you look into it, there's, uh, there's something, there are some things that are missing, for instance, so that you could be wondering about. So let's start the so Socratic thing. So what's wrong or what's a little fishy about that, uh, that movie? Well, yes. Yeah, uh, so that assumes you have a very good telescope. So those, I think, in a sense, are right. But, but one thing that, that, that's true, in the, uh, so one, one question then is how close do you have to be okay, to see that? To see that, you have to be at 50 solar, solar at a distance, geometric distance of 50 solar mass from the binary. So that, that's pretty close. It's, uh, it's, so all, uh, it's a question already whether you'd, you'd really have, uh, you could really see gravitational waves there or you're in the near field zone where things are a little strange. But sure. What else? Yeah, so magnification. So the shapes are correct, in fact, because that's a ray tracing uh, simulation of, uh, uh, you know, just take the image at the back, send all the, the rays across the, the right geodesic, light light geodesics around the geometry, and that's what you see. But magnification, you expect also to have uh, an amplification of, uh, of luminosity, right? So in particular, you, you'd, uh, and not just that, redshifting, right? The big thing in, in, in uh, curved backgrounds. So the light that gets really close to the edge, you'd expect it to be really redshifted and not just the same color of everything else. So they didn't do that because that would, would get it pretty messy and not as pretty. Uh, you, you wouldn't see the edges uh, as well. You, you'd be a little blinded where you have, uh, you know, a convergence of light rays and so on. Um, so it was fun to think that that's what the public now are thinking, is thinking black holes are. Yes? Of the two black holes? Um, yeah. Uh, that's true, but there is angular momentum, right? And, and you don't lose that even at the very end. In fact, the, the final end point of, uh, of the merger is a spinning black hole, and most of the spin comes from the orbital spin. So it, it's true that it, it gets, the inspiral gets to be less uh, of an inspiraling uh, orbit, and, there's a, and the radial accelerations are certainly stronger, but there still is some. some. So that's correct, actually, because that, that's a true solution of Einstein's equations. Um, the other thing, the other small systems you can, uh, you can make gravitational waves with are, are Newton stars. Um, so in particular here we're seeing a pulsar, okay, one of the two Newton stars is emitting radio, uh, pol radio emission along its axis and it's, uh, it appears to be pulsed to us because there's this lighthouse effect that we see the beam passing us. Uh, so that's a, a representation, okay, a movie <laughs> of the system that gave the original indirect confirmation of the existence of gravitational waves. Okay, the Hulse-Taylor pulsars, 
uh, this, uh, discovery in 1974, uh, a pulsar in a binary, uh, close enough that you have a loss of energy to gravitational waves, and that the period of, uh, you know, the binary period decreases over years with just the shape and with just the, uh, the time dependence that's expected by Einstein's quadruple formula, so by the leading order loss to, uh, uh, of energy to gravitational waves. So, dual neutron stars, uh, very good for that reason, already told us and showed us that gravitational waves exist. The other advantage that they had uh, in, in the mind of LIGO analysts and LIGO physicists so far was that we knew that such systems existed. Okay, we knew in the galaxies at least five to seven uh, uh, double neutron star systems, uh, all of which, you know, sometime in the future would be proper LIGO, uh, LIGO sources in the, in the right band. And um, so that's, uh, what's my next slide? Um, this is an actual simulation as opposed to just an artist's rendition of a merger of two Newton stars. So Newton stars, you think, are definitely messier than black holes because they do have matter, okay, or, or it's nuclear matter. Um, so, so you expect to have some very complicated uh, um, interaction, hydrodynamic interaction even between the stars once they reach they get close enough to break each other apart and then eventually merge. That's true, and these systems are very challenging to, uh, to simulate, but it's true also that uh, for the band that, uh, the frequency band that's accessible to, to ground-based experiments, they're still pretty far. So treating them as point masses was sufficient to get a, very, a pretty good idea of what the waveform would look like. Um, so that's both a blessing and a curse. A blessing because uh, you could say, we have Newton stars. They exist in binaries in our galaxies. One day they're going to merge. If we take uh, a million galaxies, uh, we're going to have one Newton star that merges every year, on the average, close enough for us to see, and we know how it's going to look like because it's just two point masses going around each other. To first approximation, they, uh, they, they, are, they will be just the, the, the simplest Newtonian in spiral plus, you know, Einstein's energy emission that we're going to derive tomorrow, in fact. Uh, we can be actually more sophisticated and use uh, post-Newtonian corrections to, uh, to the orbits and do better with that, uh, but it'll be a great, you know, first thing to detect. Then, uh, you know, as we get more sensitive, maybe we'll also access this, uh, this high frequency uh, range uh, of its emission, where the fact that they're not just point masses, but they're balls of uh, nuclear matter and of matter as, as supernuclear densities is evidence, and we'll learn things about the equation of state. Uh, the other attraction is that, you know, there are gamma ray bursts, these very uh, somewhat mysterious events, in uh, very energetic events, and uh, Newton star mergers are expected to be the engine to produce short, hard gamma ray bursts. So when, when you see a uh, Newton star binary with, uh, with LIGO, let's say, and if you're lucky enough to see also a gamma ray burst in the same uh, direction in the sky at the same time, you can get the final association of this. There's, in fact, a, a big industry of, uh, of working out what the electromagnetic counterparts would be to such an event, a Newton star merger. Um, black holes are dark, so you don't expect to see anything, any light from a merger. It's just gravitational waves is pretty much how you learn about it. But from emerging, from emerging Newton stars, you could see a gamma ray burst. Uh, you expect to see perhaps afterglows. You see radio emission. You have something uh, called a kilonova, which is uh, um, somewhat less than a supernova. And in, you know, with different time scales, so, so definitely enough to get astronomers excited about following up this, this event. Uh, and I was telling you, you get access to the hydrodynamics, to the structure of Newton stars, so that tells you about the equation of state of matter in Newton star, just their structure and how um, matter behaves at this supernuclear density, it's a, a regime that not, that's not achieved or realized anywhere else in, in nature. Um, so again, a big industry in theory in working out what the equation of stars are, that the equation of state is for Newton stars. Uh, an equation state is mapped by this, uh, you know, Oppenheimer-Volkov equation that you probably learned about in uh, general relativity courses. is mapped into a mass radius uh, relation, and you have uh, you have stiff and soft equation of state. A stiff equation of state is where uh, the uh, the matter pushes back against gravity uh, more strongly, and so those are. Um, those that give you the, the largest radii, so the largest neutral star for the same mass. 
And you can certainly uh, try to see this effect if you, can, if you can see gravitational waves at high enough frequencies. And people have run simulations of, uh, uh, of merging Newton stars with you know, some assumption about what the matter does and some simplifications. But, but definitely you can see that if you have a soft um, equation of state, a smaller, uh, smaller Newton stars, they can last longer in inspiring around each other before they break up and, and, and create a single merged object. Um, it's kind of cute, I think, that the, the standard scale for the uh, softness of uh, Newton stars goes from uh, um, 4b uh, to 4h, to 4b, 3b, hb, 4h, which you may recognize as pencils, right? It's, uh, it's what you get graphite for. So that's, that's become somewhat uh, a shorthand for that. Um, and there's really one parameter, which is this tidal love number, so the tidal deformability of the Newton star, that's the parameter, that's the first one you, you would see having effects in the, uh, in the spiral. Uh, because it's uh, in addition to losing energy to gravitational waves, you're also dumping energy into the tidal um, excitation of the, uh, of the stars. Um, a similar uh, system that also can get you insight into Newton star equation of state and the structure of Newton stars is a, um, a mixed binary where you have a black hole and a Newton star. So there you, can, you expect to, to tidally disrupt the Newton star when it gets close enough, right? The, uh, just the tidal field, so the fact that the black hole is pulling in slightly different directions uh, in different, uh, different places in the Newton star breaks it apart. And how soon it breaks it apart depends on how big the Newton star is. So the, 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 the first order effect of something like this is that uh, you, you, don't, uh, you have a sudden uh, drop off of uh, gravitational wave amplitude. So the, the waveform ends sooner because you've broken apart uh, your neutral star into this, you know, this cloud of, of matter. Um, so I'm talking a lot about binaries because, I, as I was saying, they're the prototypical uh, source of gravitational waves. They're the easiest way to get enough uh, accelerated mass around to, um, to generate something that you can see. But in fact, there's really a lot that you can learn about it, about nature, about gravity, and about astrophysics from just these binary systems. And all that information is all encoded in the waveform, okay? the, the signal that you observe. Um, so just quickly in this table, uh, from, uh, from stellar mass uh, binaries, you learn about the populations of the uh, systems of the stars, stellar remnant that uh, generated them. You may learn about uh, the equation of state of Newton stars. You may learn about processes um, in, in, uh, that emit uh, visible light or you know, infrared radio or whatnot around the system after it emerges uh, from the in spirals of massive black holes at the center of galaxies, you learn about those populations. Um, you expect massive black holes to merge because after galaxies merge, they each carry their big central black hole at the center, they find each other, they form a binary, and some of them in, in spiral uh, quickly enough that they eventually uh, get where they can be seen. To see those, you'll need something like LISA, a space-based experiment. But they will tell you a lot about the coevolution of uh, galaxies and binaries across the, uh, the universe. And of course, uh, you know, there's also GR. You can do all this business by just assuming that Einstein was right. That's our reference theory. That's what we're using. But you can also challenge it and try to test whether the waveforms that you observe are really those predicted by general relativity or whether, the, you know, there, there's some alternative theory of gravity that's a better explanation from them. Uh, the other assumption is uh, uh, black holes. Okay, so, so we say, so you can look at astrophysics. You can look at fundamental physics uh, in terms of whether Einstein was right, really, whether GR has any uh, alterations at this level. Uh, you can also try to test whether these black holes are really black holes, are really the simple Schwarzschild or Kerr solutions that uh, you get from your equation, or is there something different about them? You can do those with binaries also, especially with a very asymmetric binary, where you have a, a small black hole or a small neutron star spiraling into a very big one. A system like that has, uh, you know, uh, takes a very long time to spiral because the, the slowing down of the, the loss of energy of the small body is proportional to the uh, ratio of the masses between them. So you expect to be able to follow those if you have a space-based uh, experiment for hundreds of thousands of cycles. If you do something like that, that's a very, very high precision measurement of motion of 
quasi geodesic motion in a uh, in a background geometry, a, a, a black hole geometry, and that would be a, a, a very good test of the nature of the of the central object by way of its multiples, for instance, by the uh, um, the gross structure of geometry around it. Okay, so lots of binaries. Uh, there are other sources that I, I know less about because I, I, I think I always thought they were more speculative and a little bit more. Uh, you know, high-risk bets, in a sense, to see. So let's see. So for instance, supernova, which is uh, there at the bottom, well, definitely you expect uh, to, to have uh, some non-spherical asymmetric uh, uh, acceleration of mass in a supernova. The problem is that it's relatively little mass, uh, little enough that you hope to see, you can probably hope to see one if it's in our galaxy only. And supernova in our galaxy, they come once a century. Okay, so worth looking for and, and uh, uh, you know, worth doing the analysis for, but probably not, not a very good bet in terms of uh, making money. So think there at the bottom left are cosmic strings. Okay, so this hypothesized uh, fundamental object generated in, uh, in the early universe, which should uh, give off gravitational waves very nicely, uh, thanks to this, you know, very pretty kinks and also string recombination and so on. But, you know, speculative object, also one for which we, we don't really, uh, we almost have no clue about what its typical parameters would be. So worth looking for, and certainly writing papers about where, when we don't find it, but, uh, uh, you know, not a mainstream source. Uh, at top left, that would be an isolated pulsar, so a single Newton star that's rotating very rapidly. Uh, how do you make new, uh, gravitational waves from that? Not just from the rotation. You either need to put it tumbling, you know, to, to, to have like a, a, some kind of tumbling and processing motion that, that, that gives you a time-dependent uh, quadruple, which is what you want. Or you can put little mountains on, on it. Uh, if you just stick things to it and make it rotate very fast, that's your dumbbell. That's your, uh, you know, time-dependent quadruple again. Um, problem is, you know, those have such strong gravity. They're so small and so dense that it's very hard to make mountains on, uh, on Newton stars. Um, so you, some of the papers in the LIGO collaboration that were in the last 10 years were claimed to be to have astrophysical significance were putting limits on the non-ellipsoidal uh, uh, non deformations of uh, pulsars in our galaxy, such as the crab. Okay, but those limits were probably still a few orders of magnitude away from, uh, from the kind of deformations that you may expect to have. And then, you know, uh, relic, gravitational wave radiation, things from uh, cosmology, things from the early universe. Um, very interesting for what they could tell you about the uh, early universe, but pretty hard to come up with a scenario that makes them strong enough that you would see them with current experiments. They tend to be uh, really, uh, really suppressed for ground base, for LISA, uh, for, uh, for pulsar timing, which is the, the third technique I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, see my time, okay. Um, there was an experiment called the Big Bang Explorer, which was kind of like a high-powered super LISA in the sky, uh, super expensive and super future, which uh, was supposed to reach the standard inflation level for gravitational waves in a decihertz or uh, hundreds of a hertz. So, you know, if, uh, if you live to be 100, uh, some, some of you may see such an experiment. Okay, let's, let's move on to, um, to the main ways to look for gravitational waves at different frequencies. But let me take a, a quick break to see if there's a question about this or comments or sources. Yes. The abundance. Okay. Right. Um, so the question is uh, about the relative abundance of different sources. Uh, that's, uh, that's usually taken experiment by experiment because you have people, say, doing, uh, doing LIGO, they want to know what they're going to, to look for. So if you, if you look at LIGO, so sources between 10 and 1,000 hertz, uh, as I was saying, the, the mainstream Bona 
phi the uh, system was a, a dual neutron star, a double neutron star, uh, because we knew that these things existed. Okay, and uh, with rates of about maybe once per year with, at a good sensitivity, a little more if you're lucky. Okay, so uh, black holes, uh, black holes would be more rare, but there would be stronger signals. So you could actually see more with the same experiment per year. The problem being we didn't know that they existed. We actually didn't know that black hole binaries existed until one was seen back in September. Uh, so with that observation, I think now uh, those uh, black hole binaries are, are probably considered more abundant and to have higher rates per, and for the same moving volume in the universe than uh, uh, neutron stars. Mixed system, we don't know at this point. So, uh, so all that we know are from population dynamic simulation. But those are, have lots of uh, uncertainties. So, so the way you come up with something like that, you just start with uh, your typical stars, you know, with an initial mass function, put them in binaries, and then evolve those binaries through simulations and through lots of, lots of theoretical assumptions. From two stars, you have to do two supernovae, okay, to get a neutron star in a black hole. Uh, and you, you have a common envelope phases, very, very complicated physics, so that the final results were had the orders of magnitude uncertainty. So really, um, very little is, will, is still known about uh, the, those rates other than what we can tell from observations, which will be the driver uh, going, going forward. Uh, if you look, uh, um, I'll talk a little bit later about sources in the low frequency band. So, but, but there, supermassive black holes um, certainly are assumed to be the, the, the most uh, the, the dominant source, but there's something else. There are uh, binaries of uh, white dwarfs, typically, in our galaxy. Okay, so there are um, probably 100 million such binaries in our galaxy, and uh, all of those are, would be sources for a space-based uh, um, detector, some below the, uh, the threshold of uh, individual detection, so just making up some kind of uh, stochastic noise together, and some about it, maybe, uh, thousands. Okay, so detection. Um, since, you know, people are getting prizes for gravitational wave detection, and uh, you know who those people are, uh, <laughs> okay, so, so, but um, I, I thought it was worth going a little bit back to the person who probably started the whole thing, so Joseph Weber, who in the 60s, 60s started doing experiments with resonant bars to detect gravitational waves, and actually for a few years was convinced um, actually, throughout his life, he remained convinced that he had seen them. He couldn't, however, convince the uh, scientific community, and also replications of that experiment couldn't, uh, couldn't find them again. Uh, but still, this early excitement in the 60s of uh, uh, some, some detection of pretty strong events, okay, things that uh, um, were challenging to explain in energetic terms uh, in, uh, in our galaxies, those got all the excitement started and, and got all the, the movement going and eventually led to the, the big interferometric detectors and to the ideas to do things in space. So that's um, uh, in the 60s, Joe Weber, University of Maryland, the first bars, that's where everything started. Uh, these kind of detectors actually are not uh, are also outside the standard paradigm of gravitational wave, de wave detection that I'm going to uh, discuss in the next slide because the, they're actual physical resonant things where what you're, de where what you're observing is the, the shaking, is the ringing of a big physical object, okay, a bar of metal. Um, and in that sense, a gravitational wave going by is pretty much a tidal force that excites the a fundamental mode of resonance of this mass. But uh, for modern uh, detection, uh, it's easier to think of it in this wave. So you have the gravitational wave, that's, the, um, that's actually the particle physics view of gravitational waves where you have a, a, a graviton emitted by a binary, and all that you need to, make it, to, to look for gravitational wave is a good clock. Why? Well, uh, because actually you need two clocks maybe. Uh, if, if you compare two clocks that are displaced by space, you can get an idea of the time that it takes for light to travel between them. And a gravitational wave will alter the distance of two freely falling uh, uh, clocks or test masses in a way that's uh, periodic, okay? So it, it will apply a modulation on that distance. 
and, uh, and that's what you look for in all the experiments to detect gravitational waves. Um, if you're using pulsars, as I'll show you a little bit later, you basically are doing a one-way measurement. You have a very good clock out there. Uh, you're comparing the time that you see from that clock with your own local reference, and uh, suddenly you see a difference between the times, because uh, which you don't care about, but what, what you're looking for is kind of like a modulation on the, on the difference of the two clocks, of the rates of the two clocks. In something like LIGO or LISA or Doppler tracking, whereas when you look at a uh, spacecraft going, say, to Saturn or to Jupiter, you send a signal and you get it back. And again, uh, you compare with your local reference, you look for some modulation, you're doing two-way measurements. Okay? You have something like a mirror back there, so maybe there's only one clock that really matters. is the clock that you start with. So you're measuring. Uh, so measuring time is really how you see um, uh, changes and periodic changes in distances between test masses. So that's the principle of detecting gravitational waves. And now, um, different ways to realize this for different frequency bands. Um, but a, um, you know, as in all physical measurements, there's noise. Okay, no, no measurement is perfect. In practice, you're limited by how well you can uh, you can make things and, and and by basic limits of nature. And all the noise curves, you know, noise curves are a big thing because they tell you where uh, you're sensitive, which are your frequencies, and, and they tell you how strong you're going to, how well you're going to see a signal. They all look like that, okay? So they're good in the middle, <laughs> then they go bad <laughs> on the sides, which I like to, to describe as must get better before it gets worse, which is the opposite of what happens in life, hopefully, when you have you know, some traumatic events. It gets worse and then better. Here, it's, it's the other way around. And, uh, and, and the reason uh, that happens is, uh, in very general terms, is that uh, so we're measuring the distance, uh, perhaps as measured by light, between two freely falling objects. That's the basic measurement. So then there, there are two big things here. One is how well you can measure that distance. So just in, in metric, in metrologic terms, okay? So uh, to what uh, fraction of a wavelength of light? So that's imprecise measurement, and that's what, you, what, what eventually uh, worsens, gets you to, to be less and less sensitive at high frequencies. Okay, there's another effect there, which is uh, also that your experiment needs to be commensurate with the waves that you're looking for, so that if, uh, uh, if, if the wavelength or gravitational wave get to be much smaller than the reference distance that you're measuring, then the effect basically cancels out. Okay, so that's also built into this imprecise measurement. On the other side, at low frequency, what happens is that these freely falling test bodies, well, they're not really freely falling. In, uh, on the ground-based experiments, you, you have masses suspended on pendula uh, that are supposed to be freely falling in that direction, right, in the direction of measurement. Well, there are residual noises of them, so they're shaking a little bit, and, and that to, lo to you looks like a gravitational wave, but it's not. In space, same thing, and for pulsars, uh, for pulsars, you have that the, uh, the reference clock that you have, your, your, uh, the rotation of the pulsar is not quite stable, as stable as you expect. So then, you know, you, you map that into the actual experiments, and uh, so, for instance, the measurement noise for ground base is photon shot noise, effectively, uh, just your limitation in, in measuring a distance based on how many uh, photons you have. There's thermal noise at low frequencies, space-based similar story, uh, shot noise and uh, acceleration noise, so there is acceleration on the test masses at low frequency, and pulsar timing, Again, timing noise, so measurement noise, and at low frequency, stability noise, the stability of your basic uh, reference. So um, these are the three leading uh, techniques to uh, detect gravitational waves. Each maps to a different frequency band. High frequency for uh, LIGO, for ground -based, LIGO and Virgo, ground-based experiments. Low frequencies, 10 to the minus 3 hertz, or around that for space-based and even lower frequency, in nanohertz, so 10 to the 9 hertz, for measurements that you do by looking at uh, neutron stars as a, uh, as a reference. So I'll go through uh, each of these in turn. Um, and I have, I have a few movies for that, but we're also going to do a simple computation on the blackboard. So the basics of a ground-based interferometer are the fact that, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you make a simple Michelson a scheme where you split light at the beam splitter, you send it to distant mirrors, then you get it back. 
Okay, if you arrange everything uh, so that the arms of the interferometer are uh, perfectly equal, then you have a perfect destructive interference at the output port of the interferometer, so you don't see any light. On the other hand, if, you, uh, if now the arms are changing a little bit because the gravitational wave is going by, uh, you get a little bit of uh, constructive interference, or not as perfectly destructive, and you get some power on the output port of the interferometer. Um, this is the basic of uh, uh, interferometric detectors, and they, they're sensitive at, uh, uh, in the tens to thousands uh, of hertz, and they're incredibly precise uh, uh, tools, incredibly precise experiments, so, because you need it, okay? So, uh, I'm going to show you tomorrow that the typical, and we said already, that the typical amplitude of a gravitational wave on Earth for something that you expect to see uh, about once per year is a part in 10 to the 21. Okay, so let, let's see how we can, uh, what we need to measure something like that using interferometry. Let's see. First of all, this is a strain, okay? So, this is a fractional change in the length, so how big an effect we see depends on how big we can make the interferometer. The biggest we make it, the more amplified, the more we amplify this effect. So what's, what can we make on Earth? People started in their lab, so it was five meters, then they took, they took over a building in a university, so you got to be maybe 40 meters, and then you start saying, okay, what's the biggest that I can make uh, such a thing? And they, it's, it's around, it's something like uh, four kilometers. Okay, if you go beyond that, it's a problem to find a place that's flat enough, and also you start to have a problem because the photons are falling in the gravitational field of the Earth. Okay, so we have four kilometers, so that means that the effect that we're going to see uh, is going to be something like five, give me a, a five, ten to the minus 18 meters. Okay, so that's pretty small. You may worry that uh, you don't actually have uh, uh, that you get into a, a small fraction of the size of a proton, so how do you measure the, the, a small fraction of the size of a proton? Well, you're not measuring that, okay? You're measuring something that's uh, macroscopic, a heavy, you know, mirror something at, at the end, so that's fine. The wavelength, the quantum wavelength of that is way smaller than this, that's not a problem. But how do you measure it, okay, with interferometry? Uh, interferometry um, with a laser, that's the most stable light we can get. Uh, typically use infrared lasers, so the, the wavelength of the infrared laser is going to be something like a micron. Okay, so 10 to the minus 6 meters. Uh, so that means that we have to, uh, to go down to something like, uh, we have to resolve a difference in phase in a wavelength of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 12. Actually 5, 10 to the minus 12 cycles. So that's uh, by contrast, I think the original Michelson uh, uh, measurement, which established, uh, uh, you know, that the speed of light is, uh, is constant in, in every, uh, no matter what your state of motion is, okay, was on the order maybe of uh, a twentieth or a hundredth of a, of a wavelength of light. So, you know, although we still call that a Michelson interferometer, it's a very different Michelson interferometer. So how do you resolve such a small um, uh, such a small wavelength. Well, the idea is that you use lots of light. Okay, so typically uh, you can resolve uh, interferometrically uh, a distance to something like the wavelength divided by uh, the square root of the number of photons that you have. Okay, so, so let's see. Uh, a, de a decent laser, something that uh, is going to burn your retina if you're pretty fast, if you, if you look at it, is something like one watt. So, how many photons in one watt? Uh, a, um, an infrared photon of uh, one micron has, is about uh, one electron volt. Maybe it's 1.2. So, that give you, gives you something like, and also that's power, uh, but we are going to, uh, to effectively integrate our measurement. So, to, you know, to turn power to energy before we count photons, we want to observe things at uh, around, around 100 hertz. So, that gives us 10 milliseconds to integrate uh, the 1 watt power. So, that gives, uh, if you work it out, um, it gives you something like uh, 5, 10 to the 16 photons. 
square root of this is something like, uh, you know, okay, 2 10 to the 8. So, uh, so the gain that we can get on, uh, in addition to this is something like uh, uh, 4 10 to the minus 9. Okay, so 4 10 to the minus 9. And we need uh, 5 10 to the minus 12. Okay, so we're still a little off. So what can you do? You know, the answer already you can still tell us. So you don't have to, you don't have to solve it on the spot. Yes? Yeah, of course. Put an amplifier in front of the laser and keep it stable enough. Um, so in advanced LIGO, in fact, you're working with something like 200 watts. Okay, so, um, you know, which is pretty powerful, but, but it still won't burn things down. So, however, that only gives you a factor of, uh, um, again, a square root of that. Okay, because number of photons, you, you gain with the square root of the number of photons. But that's good, so that gives a, is a factor of, uh, what square root of 200? <laughs> okay, 12, 13. So, 14, actually. Um, so, we need another factor of 100, roughly. So where, I, where am I going to get that? Yes. Yes, yeah. So since uh, um, the most we can do is four kilometers, but how about we do multiple bounces? Okay, so uh, one way you could arrange it is actually to put your mirrors in just a way that uh, you, you, you do some complicated uh, uh, scheme and bounce back, but you can only do that two or three times before you get to, you start confusing the beams and, and getting straight light into one, one another. So what you do instead is that you turn your microphone into what's known as a fabric pearl interferometer by making cavities along both arms. So you have a mirror here that's going to be uh, only partially reflective so that once you, you put light inside the cavity, it will tend to, on average, to do something like 100 bounces back and forth. And, and then it filters back. So that's true on the average, right? Because some, uh, if you look at the individual photon, you can say, okay, this photon went back after doing one, one trip and some other went and did 100 and so on. Um, on the average, let's say 100. So that's the factor of 100 that you need to, to get something like 10 to the minus 21. You can do other tricks, you know, you can, uh, typically you'd put a mirror here also. This would be a power recycle mirror, so that uh, all the power that would, in a, you know, in a microphone would go back to the laser is actually reflected back in. Uh, you could put a mirror here also to do what's known as signal recycling, which is modifying the, um, the optical state of the, uh, of the layers in such a way that uh, you get a, a little factor again. Uh, of course, if you put a factor of 100 here, that means that your circulating power is going to be 100 times that inside the cavities. So it starts to be on the order of kilowatts, and you start to, be, to warm up things significantly. And so, in fact, cooling down the mirrors when you have a kilowatt of light that's impinging on them is one of the challenges in LIGO. Okay, so I did my little blackboard thing, so I'm happy. Um, three big uh, ground-based interferometers, the two LIGOs and Virgo, uh, which is a French-Italian uh, interferometer in, uh, um, in Tuscany, in fact, in Cascina, in Tuscany. So initial ideas in the 70s, built in the 90s. Science runs in initial configuration for both LIGO and Virgo in the 2000s. Didn't see anything. But finally, upgrades that got them down this final factor of 10, so initial LIGO didn't quite have that uh, 200 vol uh, watts and had, had uh, some, some other um, reasons to have reduced sensitivity. Uh, so now they're both advanced. Virgo is not quite online yet at, uh, at this final sensitivity. So it's hoped to be taking data together with the LIGO interferometers maybe at the beginning of the next year. And there's, uh, these are very complicated instruments because that's the basic measurement I gave you. But of course, there's all kinds of noise on top of it. So for instance, uh, you can't afford to have any gas uh, in, you know, you can't have your lasers pro propagating uh, uh, through any significant gas because you, you, you get uh, dispersion. 
uh, or have any gas around the test masses because they get buffeted and get shaken by it. So you have high vacuum. In a kilometer scale environment, you, you have a, a, a very complicated seismic, seismic isolation because everything on the Earth shakes. So you have uh, kind of like four stages of pendula attached to four stages of uh, um, the other way around or, or, of active uh, suspension. Uh, you need to have high power lasers and your mirrors, they have to be very ideal objects, okay? They can't be shaking themselves because they're warm or they will be because you, you're operating at room temperature, say, but you want to have them to be such perfect uh, uh, monolithic uh, chunks of silica in this case that all the thermal noise will be concentrated at a perfect frequency. So the Q, so the, the, the quality factor for this, uh, these mirrors is something like 10 to the 7, which means that if their typical model oscillation is, say, at 10 hertz, um, then uh, uh, in a, uh, the damping of an excitation will be uh, 10 to the 6 seconds, okay? So they ring forever, pretty much. And that quality factor also tells you how concentrated noise is in the uh, typical frequencies, the uh, natural frequencies of oscillation. And that's what all those lines are, in fact. All the different thermal modes of oscillations that you have in the system, the masses, the pendula, all that is uh, concentrated onto uh, a little... Um, you know, little lines effectively that you can just notch out, cancel out of your um, experiment. And that's what the improvement is between the, fa the faint lines and the, and the solid ones is between the first generation, the initial LIGO interferometers, and the advanced ones. Um, and that's a factor of 10, and it's the factor of 10 that made all the difference between seeing only noise and between getting finally a signal. Uh, you needed a factor of 10 to have enough galaxies within your range that even something that happens only every million years for each typical galaxy, you get in a year or a shorter time than a year. Um, there's a broader international network of ground-based interferometers that includes Virgo, but that also includes a, an interferometer in Japan and an upcoming one in India, um, which will, is actually a copy, a replica of one of the uh, US interferometers. So the reason you want to have many is that uh, uh, just the, the two or the three detectors don't tell you very well where a source is in the sky. Uh, you get, uh, we'll, I'll tell you more about that on Thursday maybe, the, uh, the position in the sky you get pretty much from the, with the, from the time of flight of the signal between the instruments. And to do better triangulation, you need a more, a more solid <laughs> as opposed to plain uh, configuration. So, whereas uh, with only the two LIGO, Hanford, and Livingston, you can probably um, position typical events to hundreds of degrees in the sky, which is very, very bad, right, compared to what the telescope would focus on. Um, with the entire international network, you can probably do something like uh, over the one degree in the sky. Um, we'll need a few more years to have the full, uh, the full network online. Okay, uh, science goals, a lot about binaries, uh, but of course uh, supernovae, as I was telling you, uh, deformed Newton stars, cosmological backgrounds, there's really lots of different sources that's, uh, that they're looking at. Let's go to space. Okay, you replicate the idea of doing interferometer in space. In space, you have a lot more space, <laughs> okay? Also, things move more slowly. You don't have to worry about seismic noise. So the concept was, was LISA, right? The triangle, so that you could actually do three uh, interferometric combinations flying around the sun, a little be beyond Earth, once per year, okay, so in Earth-based orbit. And the interferometry you do there uh, is a little simpler because uh, uh, let's say instead of four kilometers, you're going to have uh, something like five, ten to the uh, ten million kilometers, okay? So that's a factor of a million that you gain there in your, uh, in your measurement. Uh, you lose on the number of photons, because again, you have your one watt laser, something like that, maybe a few watts that you can, uh, something that you can build and put on a spacecraft. Uh, it's hard to do 200 watts in space without significant solar panels and, uh, and whatnot. Um, so, and by the time you're, you've sent a laser five million kilometers away, it's really broad, okay? Even a laser is the focused to maybe a mile in diameter. So you're at the level of a picowatt, maybe 10, 
maybe 100 actually, picowatts at the distance spacecraft. So the number of photons that you get is only something like 6, 10 to the 11. It's low power, but uh, uh, the loss from this is more than made up for that. So, uh, in fact, LISA, although it's in space, it seems extremely difficult to do uh, laser interferometry at uh, uh, millions of kilometers, is actually about a million times simpler than doing it on the ground. Um, which is good because, you know, if things break in space, you can't really fine tune things in space when they're up there. You can do a little, but what the video is showing you in the meantime is, uh, uh, is the interferometric setup. And it should have shown you here, right, that uh, um, you don't have hanging mirrors from Pendula in space. What you have is these cubical test masses that have to, you have to put, in, put into an approximation to free fall. And the way you do it is uh, what's called a drag-free uh, configuration. So you have this, this, this little cube that's a reference for your measurement at the center of your spacecraft. And you monitor it and you move the spacecraft around it so that all the stray forces from solar wind, uh, from, uh, um, I don't know, micrometeorites, little dust and so on, um, you're protecting the test mass with the entire spacecraft from them and using little thrusters on the sides of the spacecraft to move around it. So you're really protecting free fall at the center of, uh, um, uh, for your points of reference. And now, actually, let me skip this a bit uh, for a second to tell you that uh, it's recent news, just from last week, that this uh, free fall in space, this drag-free configuration, was tested in the LISA Pathfinder mission, which was flown by the European Space Agency with also some NASA uh, components, after a long time, it was a long time coming, okay? When, when I got into the LISA business, uh, LISA Pathfinder was promised for, for 2005, and actually for a way smaller budget that it eventually got, but finally it was launched last year. It just reported uh, uh, the initial results. Pathfinder is not a, a full LISA. It's just basically, in a sense, it's just uh, it's taking one of these five million kilometers arm and, and, and fitting it within a single spacecraft. So just to 50 centimeters. So what it tests, it's not the interferometric measurements, it tests that you can actually keep two uh, test masses in, in free fall to sufficient approximation that eventually LISA would be possible. And so that's what, uh, I think I have a zoom here, so that's the, uh, that's the configuration. Two test masses and you, you're measuring the relative distances and you're still pushing on the spacecraft using thrusters to keep, uh, keep it in uh, approximate uh, to be centered. And the, the measurement was actually quite spectacular. So, um, you know, in, in uh, space experiments, people like to be conservative so that, uh, you know, they, they can claim a success <laughs> when, once things are done. Uh, so, um, so the wedge at the top, you know, that gray wedge was the, uh, the required um, accuracy, the required precision of, of the, sorry, the required tolerance in free fall for Pathfinder. Uh, in fact, the experiment did much better. It, it reached something like uh, 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 1.25 times the LISA requirement. So you could take that system that flew on LISA Pathfinder and you could use, use that very system on the LISA spacecraft and you get effectively the promised LISA performance. Um, the residual uh, noises that you see are um, at high frequency sensing noise, so just limitation on your interferometry. At mid frequency, uh, gas resi ga residual damping from the gas around the, um, the test mass, and at low frequency, a centrifugal force. So uh, that piece of news, where the, um, what was it, June 7, they released it, was the second thing that made people very happy this year, other than the LIGO announcement. Uh, so it's hoped, it's really hoped that, uh, going back here, um, the LISA mission, which was again promised to me as a grad student for 2011, and on which I, I did work for 10 years at NASA, uh, and then uh, which was then canceled <laughs> in 2011 because NASA had other more expensive things to see, um, and is now a mission for the 2030s, okay, uh, by the European Space Agency. Well, we hope we can maybe push that a little forward and, and doing it a little earlier. On, uh, on the wave of excitement for the detection of gravitational waves and on this confirmation that the basic technology for free fall that uh, LISA will need is actually uh, not just feasible, is uh, proven. 
Um, okay, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. So, uh, this little animation here was to, um, to show you something uh, amusing, I would say, which is uh, in space, uh, you cannot make the arm sequel because you're limited to what uh, you know, trajectories around the, uh, the sun will give you. So you're, typically, your triangle is, uh, is pretty unequal. If you do that, your basic Michelson doesn't work. You're not canceling out light uh, at the, uh, after you reflect it back. Uh, and if you're not canceling out light, that means you're not canceling out the basic noise in your laser, which is, uh, uh, is something you, you would easily confuse with gravitational waves. Uh, so there's actually a very, a very pretty scheme in LISA, which is called uh, time delay interferometry, uh, where you create a basically a double Michelson, where you're sending light along, along both paths before you recombine it. And you don't, you don't really have mirrors, because as I was telling you, uh, by the time you get to the distant spacecraft, you, you're at 100 pico, picowatts. So if you just put a, a mirror there, you're going to get 10 to minus 12 of that back. And no, that's no photons at all. Okay, so what you do is instead of putting a mirror, you actually measure the laser between all the pairs of spacecraft. You take these measurements and then you sum them up with the right time delays and you reconstruct in a synthesized interferometer. That's what time delay interferometry refers to. And since you're doing that, you may as well doing as many bounces and, and complicated schemes as you like. So there are many uh, complications on top of that. You can send light around, do what's called the Sanyak scheme. You can do quadrupole bounces and so on. Uh, and that's the kind of things that I was doing working on LISA uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Um, so while uh, I, I'm definitely not an experimentalist who can uh, build a real interferometer, it was fun to do it in, uh, by just taking signals and summing them algebraically. Yes? Yeah, but, but, but that, that gives you a, a narrow band interferometer. So uh, you, you only need one arm, actually. You don't even need to do interferometry. If, uh, you can do a measurement like that. But uh, you want to be broadband because you want to see spirals, uh, chirping signals, like right? you want to see lots of, lots of things. OK, so uh, this was a slide with the uh, classic LISA science goals. Uh, so in spirals of massive black hole binaries, this extreme mass ratio systems, MRIs, where you have a small body going around a big one, lots of cycles. All the, the uh, yellow, all, all the blue, light blue dots are uh, binaries in our galaxy of white dwarfs, typically. And the, um, the yellow one are systems that are known optically as binaries to be binaries of white dwarfs. So things that uh, you know are there and that they will be there once LISA turns on. So those are... Um, guaranteed sources for, for LISA. One thing that, uh, uh, another reason for excitement is this, you know, blue lines on the, uh, on the right, LIGO binaries. Somebody calls them actually Cesana binaries for Alberto Cesana who pointed out that they, they exist. Um, and the story behind those is that uh, the system that was seen by LIGO earlier this year with black holes of 30 solar masses is actually heavy enough that if you uh, go back in time a year or two, it would be in the LISA band or in a LISA-like experiment band. So m you might have the same system that you first see here with a space-based interferometer for a year because it's evolving slowly. Then you wait and then you see it with a ground-based interferometer. So that's, uh, it's a new source. It's also an exciting prospect to, to do things together with the two. If you have one year of advance notice, you can do some things. You, for, for certain, you make sure you're, you're taking data when it comes, but also you'll know roughly where it is in the sky uh, because LISA um, in astronomical, uh, in, in telescope terms has a very long baseline, okay? It's going around the sun, so the parallax to the, to the source is, is big. That puts it in the, in, in the sky with a, with a reasonably small uh, error. So positioning is much better in this low frequency band than in the, in the big. So that's about, that's the same thing. It shows you the power of the, signa, of the signals um, from heavy stellar mass black holes as it gets out of the ELISA band and into a, a something like advanced LIGO. Um, okay, so last one, last technique. Oh, okay, I have more audio here. So that's a pulsar. Okay, so a, a neutral star emitted in, emitting in radio waves along the poles, 
but the emission axis is misaligned with respect to the rotation axis. And if you're lucky to be uh, uh, in the right direction, you get this lighthouse effect. Okay, and that's why it's a pulse, um, and the, which you observe as a periodic signal uh, with the periodicity of the rotation of the Newton star. So these were the systems that were discovered by um, um, jo Jocelyn Bell Burnell, right in uh, 1967. Um, and uh, the fastest of these ones, the millisecond pulsars that have periods of a few milliseconds, are very, very good clocks. So uh, those are what we think are uh, the recycled pulsars. So pulsars which have been accelerated again by uh, accreting mass from a donor. So they, they are the lowest end of uh, the, the period scale on the x-axis, and they also have the weakest magnetic fields. So these are precision clocks, of course, just uh, so you can just, uh, if you have a very good clock on the other side of the galaxy, you can use that as your gravitational wave detector, okay? You just look for the change in the time of arrival of these pulses as a gravitational wave uh, goes by your path of propagation. Um, the typical precision of this clock is something uh, like, a, at best, 10 nanoseconds over 10 years. Okay, so you want, the, you want to look for l very slow signals uh, with periods of uh, once, the joke is uh, periods one over a grad student lifetime, okay, a grad student tenure. Uh, you want to observe them for 10 to 15 years and, and the, what you need to do, however, is to take out lots of physics still. Because these pulsars tend to be in binaries themselves. Of course, the Earth is moving around the Sun. So there are lots of deterministic signals that, uh, are, uh, that give you, uh, apparent, you know, apparent changes in the time of arrival of the pulses. Uh, these are, in fact, interesting. They tell you where the thing is in the sky to, to great precision. They also tell you the period of a binary. Uh, they tell you the change of the period in the binary, as they did for the, you know, the, the Hulse-Taylor pulsar and, and thus proving uh, the existence of gravitational waves indirectly. Uh, and they even tell you the fine details of the orbits so that you can test gravity with them. You can look for the precession of the periastron, for instance, in such a system. Um, you can look for gravitational, gravitational redshift of the signal as it goes around the companion in, in the pulsar. So you take all those effects, you parameterize all of those, and you fit all of those from the times of arrival of these pulses. And what remains is a gravitational wave signal. So this is extremely fun, I must say, to do uh, for somebody like me, because instead of uh, doing very complicated optics and buying big lasers, uh, you, get to say, you get to, okay, use radio telescopes, point them at uh, pulsars, and you can say, one, that uh, you have the largest detector of them all, because it's the size of the galaxy, and that's true, that's your baseline. And second, you can say that uh, to understand my... Um, my experiment, I don't need to understand just lasers and, uh, and oscillators. I have to understand the Newton star physics, and I have to understand the physics of propagation of signals across the galaxy. So that's a, a lot of fun, and these pulsars are really amazing, um, amazing objects. You may know this, uh, some of you may have a, a shirt that looks like that. Maybe you're not old enough to have it, because Joy Division, right, had a, was it Unknown Pleasures? I don't know, they, they, had, a, they had a record that had this iconic uh, plots of uh, um, uh, pulses from, uh, from the whole stale of pulsar um, in the 70s, maybe the early 80s. And the thing is, uh, these things are rotating very rapidly. You don't actually see the individual pulsars. They're, they're too weak individually to, to be seen like that. But once you sum them up, you align them, you get an integrated profile say you do it for 10 minutes, so you get 10,000 pulses or 100,000 pulses, and that integrated profile is extremely stable. So that's your clock, it's not the individual pulses. And this stability of the integrated profile is actually an empirical fact. It's not fully understood why it should be like that. It's probably due to the fact that uh, um, the emission mechanism is stochastic for the, the radio emission, but, uh, the, um, but the geometry and the geometry of the rotation is, uh, is, is very, very precise, effectively. So you get your regularity uh, from the, uh, the geometric stability of the, uh, of the system, and the fact that the mission is periodic just fills, kind of like the, the, fills in this profile 
stochastically, but in a way that integrates back to, to a very constant term. Uh, this is not a great simulation, but it's not, not a great uh, video, but it shows you, you know, two supermassive black holes uh, um, at, at the center of the galaxy, and then there's this train of gravitational waves that comes to you, which, I don't know, reminds me of disco more than Joy Division for some reason. And if you have a pulse, that's our galaxy, okay, you have a pulsar sending you pulses, and again, the, uh, the fact is to, to slow them and to, to, to get them faster to you depending on the phase of the gravitational wave. It's also shown as, as being red and blue because you, you could also describe that as instantaneous red shift or blue shift of the signal. Um, you don't want to do that with a single pulsar because, you know, you may understand it, but you won't trust it. It's not something that you built. It might have some, you know, some changes, some, some noise in its, uh, in its rotation. So what you do is you do it for an array of pulsars across the sky, maybe four, 40 of them. And then the effect of the gravitational waves at the moment when the signals are received on Earth is going to be common to all of them. Actually, better than common, it's going to be correlated with, with the a geometric factor that depends on the angle between any two pulsars. So you can build, a, you, can, you can, there's a curve um, known as the Hellings-Downs curve, which tells you how correlated the residuals due to gravitational waves are going to be for any pair of pulsars. And there's an international collaboration that uh, uh, tries to do this. Actually, there are three national or sovereign national consortia, European, American, and uh, Australian, that are uh, competing to, to see gravitational waves. And the main signal is the stochastic signals from the black holes at the center of galaxies. So all of them out to a Z of maybe one. Uh, and the, uh, so far, we've only done upper limits. So we've only determined that the, the data taken over the last nine, 10 years uh, cannot support the existence of a, of a signal from all those binaries stronger than some level. Uh, but these upper limits are, are beginning to uh, impinge, let's say, on the, um, on the theoretical predictions. So we, we should, uh, in effect, some, our projections are that we should be able to see the signal within the next 10 years, if the astrophysicists are right about how many uh, binaries of uh, massive black holes are in the centers of galaxies. Okay, so that's the end of it. And uh, uh, that's the other hypnotic thing, more Escher. Um, I like this field because there's, uh, there's some geometric perfection to it, and there's the Einstein theory, which is very pretty, but there's also lots of details and uh, lots of things you can learn about the dirtier physics and things, surprising things about the universe. Uh, there should be a lizard somewhere in there, if you can spot it. I don't know what it's supposed to represent, maybe uh, some kind of exotic uh, star that we, we don't know about. There's a, I can see a dinosaur, but there's also a lizard, yeah. And there's also a lonely observer somewhere sitting on, on, on some uh, step. Um, okay, so my last slide, I checked out of it, but uh, tomorrow and we're actually going to work a bit through equations in general relativity that give you uh, gravitational waves and uh, the point to see that they're natural, actually, that they're a natural prediction and uh, uh, we're going to derive uh, basic in spiral equations. On Wednesday, I don't have a lecture, but actually I have a, a talk where I'm going to tell you more about, uh, a lot more about the, the, the system of black holes that was seen back in September. On uh, Thursday, I'm going to tell you about the data analysis and statistics technique that lets us extract information from these signals. And on Friday, it's a, a little bit uh, miscell miscellaneous kind of thing, so uh, applications with, to cosmology and to testing GR. And uh, if you have questions that you come up with in the, in the meantime that uh, are going to, you're going to need, for which I'm going to need to look up things, please tell me today or tomorrow, and then on Friday I'll, I'll try to, to tell you about them. So thanks a lot.